us today. I'm going to leave my video on just to introduce myself um, and then I'll turn it off so that I'm not blocking the pictures on the screen. Um, so like Peggy said, my name is Erin Garrett. I'm an energy and environmental stewardship educator and I'm located in southernmost Illinois. Today we're going to be talking about actions that we can take in our home gardens to plan for pollinators. We usually spend most of our efforts thinking about pollinators in spring and summer, but we need to not forget about them come fall because there's a lot of important steps that we can take and actions that we can skip um, to benefit our pollinator species. So I'm going to turn my video off and we'll go ahead and move right along. Just to give you a brief outline of what we'll cover today, we're going to talk about a different perspective on garden cleanup for you to consider this year and then talk about some actions that you can take and some actions to consider skipping this fall and how we can better prepare now for next fall to support pollinators by adding fall blooming plants. Okay, the pollinators we're going to focus on today are mostly our native bees, um, as well as our moth and butterflies, but in their caterpillar form. Um, so bees are our main pollinator species. There's about 4,000 species of native bees across North America. And when we think of bees, you know, we think of the, the non-native but very important honeybee. Um, and we think about, you know, bumblebees. But there's a lot more out there. Um, and about 90% of them are solitary. So they might not be ones um, that we think about a lot and that we think about supporting um, their habitat. And then when we move to caterpillars, we know butterflies and moths are pollinators, um, but you could argue that they play an even more important role in their larval form as caterpillars. So that's what we're going to focus on today is that life stage for them. We have about 11,000 moth species across North America, give or take a thousand or two, um, and about 750 species of butterflies. Um, so just under 12,000 species of caterpillars that you could find. Um, and we um, are going to focus on their importance as a food source in, in the food um, web today. But let's start by thinking about the role of gardens for us as humans. Okay, this list is of course not comprehensive, but it includes some of the common reasons that we create and maintain gardens in our home landscapes. You know, first and foremost, they're beautiful. They add an aesthetic beauty and interest to our yards that makes us feel like we have a sense of place in our home. For many of us, gardens serve as an outlet for our creativity because we're able to experiment with color, texture, and design in a way that's both ever evolving and something we can continue to learn from as we do it. And gardening is a hobby for many of us. Um, and I know a lot more of us as we've moved through the last two years. Um, I spent way more time out in my garden than I ever had before. Um, and many of us also plant a vegetable garden or an herb garden to provide food for maybe ourselves and our family or possibly for um, a food pantry as well. But the gardens that we build and maintain, they don't just exist outside the realm of nature, but whether I want, and want them to or not, they're part of that larger scheme of nature that surrounds us. So they're performing an ecological role in our environment. What does this mean? Um, this means that they're serving as habitat for insects, birds, and wildlife. Um, besides just providing shelter, they can provide food and water sources for those insects, birds, and wildlife. And then depending on what specific plants you have in your garden, some of them can aid in filtration of water and work to improve your soil over time. So these other roles and functions come with having a garden, but the plants that we choose to put in those gardens and how we care for them can greatly affect um, how large of an ecological role that they're playing. So our focus today is on supporting pollinators, those native bees, native butterflies and moths. So to support native insects, we need to plant native plants, okay? Why is this? Um, most of the plant eating insects um, only eat plants with which they co-evolved. So if we have a native insect and it evolved over thousands of years um, eating a specific native plant, if that plant isn't there, then we won't find that insect, okay? So the key piece um, to having all of these wonderful insects is to have those native plants for them. 
And why are we focusing about insects? They're very important because they convert plants into a food source, specifically caterpillars, um, that's much more easily digested by many animals. Okay, so besides choosing the right plants, and we'll talk a lot more about that um, later on, how we care for and clean up those plants is, is important in uh, impacting their ecological role as well. So we know at this time of year, garden cleanup can improve the aesthetics of our landscape, help prepare the garden for next year's growth. Um, maybe we have some diseased plant material that we wanna clean up and get rid of, okay? Um, but we need to think about the implications of that choice, okay? Because some of these actions have the potential to negatively impact our native insects, birds, and wildlife by removing either shelter um, and or food sources um, as well. So here are some pictures from my yard last year, mid-October. Um, things are not quite this far um, in progression this year, um, but at that time, my sugar maple had nearly dropped all of its leaves. Um, I had lots of fallen pine needles. Um, all of my plant material um, was spent and not really looking that great anymore. Um, so if your landscape looks really similar, you might be like me and have that itch to want to clean it up and make it look a little bit better. But let's talk about some actions we should consider skipping. And before we move any further, I just want to mention that all of this is food for thought. There's a lot of these actions that you may do or some that you say, well, I can't do that in my home landscape. And that's okay. I don't do all of these actions um, 100%. Um, just wanted to um, share a little bit about the, the implications of these actions, just so you're aware um, of, of what happens when we do, you know, clean, mulch, and remove leaves, for example, okay? So when it comes to cleaning up, you know, we want to cut back dead stems of our perennial flowers and grasses. Um, this year, we want to maybe not cut those stems back, okay? If we're thinking about laying a fresh layer of mulch over bare soil surfaces, we want to maybe not put mulch down this fall. Okay. And I know we all have trees dropping their leaves right now as well. What do we do with those leaves? Well, maybe we want to not bag and remove them from our landscape. Okay. So why are all of these things we want to skip? And what do we do instead? We're going to go through each of them a little bit more closely. Um, so why we want to maybe not clean up all of those dead stems um, is because about 30% of our native bees nest in cavities, and those cavities can be found in plant stems um, and also wood, okay? So if we focus on dead stems first, certain species of our native bees use plant stems to nest in and lay their eggs, okay? What makes a good stem for these bees? Stems that are hollow or mostly hollow. Um, so certain stems have um, something called a pith inside. You can see that in the bottom left picture, um, that white material. Um, it's fibrous material that some bees are able to excavate out and remove, okay? So those bees would be carpenter bees and mason bees, okay? Other stems can be completely hollow on the inside, like in the photo on the right, okay? That stem was snapped in half, and that's what the inside of the stem looks like. Um, examples of plants that have hollow stems, most of our native perennial plants um, have hollow stems. Um, an example is goldenrod. Um, other plants are blackberries, um, native hydrangeas, okay, they have more of a woody stem, um, elderberry and box elder. So those are just a few examples of plants that have hollow stems that can be utilized by bees. Okay, so instead of cutting down those stems, right, if we cut down the stems, we're removing that potential nesting site. What do we do instead? Well, there's a um, series of steps that we can take that begins um, fall into this winter and will um, span the course of a year. Okay, so this fall into this winter, we're going to leave those stems on our plants. Okay, so say um, that you have, oh, I kind of think of an example off the top of my head. Um, say that you had a, a swamp milkweed plant in your yard, okay? Um, instead of cutting down that stem at the end of the season, we're gonna leave it, and we're gonna leave it through the winter, okay? Um, in the next spring, late in the spring, 
you're going to cut back those stems, but not down to the ground. We're going to cut them between eight and 24 inches. So the minimum height we want to leave is eight inches. Okay. And what we're doing at that point is we're opening up that nesting habitat. Okay. So these native bees are going to lay their eggs in the late spring, but we have to think about that now because we have to leave those stems in place now. Okay. So in late spring, um, what I heard recently is when you plant your tomatoes, so we're looking, depending on where you are in the state, <laughs> mid to late May, right? That's when you'd want to cut back those stems and leave that stubble, okay? The bees are going to find the stems, lay their eggs inside, and the larvae will start to develop. In the summertime, um, those bee um, eggs are, and larvae are going to continue to develop, and hopefully the new plant growth is going to cover up last year's growth. Now, of course, that's not going to be a perfect fix. You'll probably be able to see some of those old stems, some of that stubble um, in place. Um, but for the most part, you know, we hope that new leafy green material will cover up and hide last year's growth. Um, and then in the fall, those bees are going to overwinter. So we'll leave those stems through the following fall and winter. Okay, and in the next spring, those new bees will emerge. Okay, and hopefully by that point, that stubble will um, not really be intact anymore, right? It's made it through an entire additional year and it should start to decompose and break down on its own. If it doesn't, um, then you could remove that, those stems and that plant material, okay? Um, if you really do not like the look of your dead plant stems and stalks, you can cut them down to the ground in the fall and bundle them together and then either set them upright um, against a wall um, or hang them horizontal to the ground, okay? Um, so in this example, um, these are hosta stems, so not a native plant, but they are hollow stems. So I'm gonna try and see if I get any bees to nest. Um, but I can't stand the look of dead hosta stems. There's something about that plant. That one I just can't take. So I tried the bundle method and we'll see how effective it is. Of course, because those um, stems are not staying in the same place, it's, you know, it's not ideal um, habitat for those bees, um, but we'll see what happens. Okay, moving on from our perennial plant stems, um, bees also nest in wood, okay? Um, some bees are able to nest in soft wood because they have strong enough mandibles to excavate their own holes. Um, and that's mainly our carpenter bees. So some examples of soft wooded species um, are elderberry, pine, cedar, and cypress. Okay, so more are carnivorous tree species, um, but elderberry as well. Um, so how can you promote this type of habitat? Well, in a discrete location, um, you don't necessarily want to see a big stick pile. You can gather branches from those trees. Um, that have fallen into your lawn and make a small pile. If you have some downed logs that you can add tastefully into your garden, perhaps, um, or again, keep them, you know, behind the garage in an area that people don't see. Um, and then if you have a snag on your property and it's not a safety hazard, um, consider keeping that as well. Okay, so a snag is a tree that has died and we keep that trunk in place because um, it's wonderful habitat, not just for bees, but for many, many creatures. Okay, um, there are a whole host of other bees that use pre-existing holes or cavities that are often in wood, um, but not, you know, restricted to wood. Um, so these bees listed on the screen um, are not able to create holes or cavities themselves, but they will readily use those that they are able to find. So you may find bees nesting in small open spaces like a spigot that you have. Um, if you have any porous rocks, um, they can nest in those. And then pre-existing holes in wood, um, like holes from sap suckers or beetle larvae. So the top right is a picture of my sugar maple tree in my front yard. It is happily visited um, and utilized by birds in the area, um, but also remains a great place for bees to nest in. Okay, how can you leave cavities for the bees? Kind of the same um, as we talked about before. If you have downed logs, you can keep those. If it's not a safety hazard, you can keep a snag on your property. Um, and then I'm sure many of you have, have heard and seen 
how you can build your own mason bee home. Um, and there's many different ways to do so. And there's a lot more research being done on what's a better way than others. Um, so um, if you want to make one out of a wood block or cardboard tubes, um, if you're using wood, make sure it's untreated wood. Um, make sure that it has a cover to it because we want to protect those bees from wind and rain. Um, it needs to be hung off the ground, south facing if possible. Um, and it has to be cleaned, okay? And there's a lot of resources out there on how to clean these mason bee homes, but essentially, just like we need to clean our homes, um, we can spread diseases um, amongst different bees if these homes are not properly cleaned. Wood blocks can be put in a solution of water and bleach and reused, what I've seen is up to one year, um, but it may be best to just um, drill and make a new bee home each year. If you get cardboard tubes, you can get a paper lining on the inside and just replace the paper lining each year. Um, with wood blocks in and of themselves, if you're able to in the picture on the right, you can see that this one is actually um, pieces of wood that are stacked together. This is even better because it makes it a lot easier to take apart and clean, okay? Um, so there are a bunch of resources out there. Um, one in particular, University of Pennsylvania Extension has a great resource on building your own Mason Bee home. So you can just search um, for um, University of Pennsylvania Extension Mason Bee Home and it'll come right up, okay? We could have a whole presentation on Mason Bee Homes, but that's all I'm gonna say for right now and we'll keep moving. Um, I talked about skipping mulching, okay? Um, about 70% of our native bees actually nest in the ground. And if we have a huge amount of mulch, um, either wood mulch or rock mulch and landscape fabric, that's another thing to think about, can make it challenging for bees to find spaces to nest, okay? Um, so something like this mountain of mulch right here um, would make it impossible for a bee to reach the ground. Um, and this action for many reasons is also not great for the tree. Um, again, that's a whole separate talk that we could have, but be sparing with your mulch, okay? Um, so how can we provide habitat for bees that nest in the ground? Um, they prefer to nest in bare patches of loose dry soil um, in areas that have a, a southern slope to them, okay? Um, and you can see just a, a smattering of some of those different native bees that will nest in the ground. Okay, if you don't want to have these bare patches of ground, think about locating them, you know, not in your front yard landscape beds, but maybe in your backyard landscape beds, maybe um, behind a shrub where it's more discreet, it doesn't necessarily have to be front and center. Okay. Um, but how do we do this? If you um, have mulch currently in place, you can um, scooch it to the side and make some space, some, leave some bare ground available. You know, don't add in more landscape fabric and mulch um, if that's something that you're okay with doing. Um, and again, you want to locate those in dry, sunny spots if at all possible. Okay, for most of these um, habitat and nesting sites for bees, um, locating them in dry, sunny spots um, is preferred. Um, for the most part. All right, let's move on to leaves, okay? Um, so I know that we have lots of trees that drop a whole bunch of leaves, and um, there's a lot of different ways that you can use leaves in your yard um, rather than bagging them and removing them from your landscape or burning them. Um, but I also recognize that some of us have a lot of trees and we're not able to use all of those leaves. So when it comes to leaf management, um, a lot of the times we have to do a combination of these different actions that we're going to talk about. Okay, um, We can use those leaves as a mulch to add organic matter into our garden beds. And the reason we don't necessarily want to remove them from our landscape is that many of our caterpillar species um, will drop from trees to pupate and we'll use leaves as cover and protection. Okay, so if we remove or if we chop up and mulch that leaf litter, we're going to harm those pupa um, and then reduce their cover as well. Okay, um, so to some extent, if we're able to move and rake some of those leaves into our garden beds, we can relocate those pupa. Um, again, it depends on the scale of your garden. I typically do a combination of moving some of those leaves and then mulching um, to add organic matter into my lawn. 
Uh, again, just depends on the scale and the size of your landscape. Um, but just wanted to point out that that is an important um, source of habitat and cover and protection for those caterpillars. So even if we're providing food for them, if they don't have a safe space to complete their life cycle, then we're not fully helping those pollinator species, right? Okay, um, what should we do this fall? We talked about things to skip. What should we do? We should plant, okay? And there's a lot of different ways that we can plant um, native plants this fall. Um, fall planting for woody trees and shrubs is ideal. Um, so you hopefully are hearing um, at the garden centers, everyone is pushing woody plants right now. But it's also a great time to plant bare root native plants um, because we're transplanting these plants in their dormant period. And then you can also plant plugs of native plants. So a lot of us plant these um, plugs in spring, um, but if we plant in the fall, it can provide a little bit of an easier transition period for these plants um, to get their roots established and go dormant first, rather than having to continue to grow and produce flowers and fruits through the hot summer. Okay, so we'll look at each of these individually. Um, the number one thing um, that you can do to help native caterpillars is to plant a tree or a shrub, okay? That's because native woody plants are the best supporters of our caterpillars. You can see on the slide, there's about 5% of our native plants that provide 75% of caterpillar food, okay? And most of that 5% are woody plants. So they play a huge role. Um, there's thousands of different native plant species that we could choose to put into our garden, but if we want the biggest bang for our buck, we should plant a woody tree species. Okay, um, I mentioned already, fall is a great time to do this. Um, and if we take this the next step, we just talked about um, moving leaves. If we want to kind of eliminate that step and provide, naturally provide that habitat, we can think about planting herbaceous native plants below our trees so that those pupating moths have a safe space to develop. Okay, so if we think about this for a second, um, and I ask you, where do you think a caterpillar would rather pupate? Um, on the left is a picture I took um, of the understory of a tree when I was out hiking. You can see um, a lush expanse of native plants. And on the right, you have my lawn, right? And you have a bunch of leaves um, that are destined to be mowed over probably quite shortly. Um, I'm sure most of you would choose the um, left picture, right? But how do we make that happen in our home landscape? We create something like this, okay? Um, here is a picture um, from U of I campus um, of their Red Oak Rain Garden, and they have an amazing example of planting mostly native plants, plus the tulips, um, underneath their tree, okay? This creates something that we call a soft landing, um, that those caterpillars are able to drop and are able to complete their life cycle with the proper cover and protection that they need in this area um, because all of those leaves are also going to fall and they're not taken out of this um, garden, right? They're going to stay there and act as that natural mulch. So we're creating that habitat, we're eliminating the step for us to move or remove and deal with those leaves, and we're ultimately helping those caterpillars. Okay, when we talk about um, which native um, woody plants are the best ones to choose for caterpillars. Um, we've got some numbers on the screen here. And I want to mention um, this website that I have listed on the bottom of the screen. Um, this is a website um, to a webpage called Native Plant Finder. And you can use um, this website and put in your zip code and it will tell you how many caterpillar species in your zip code can be found on different trees, um, shrubs, and herbaceous plants as well. So these are numbers from my location in Southern Illinois, okay? But for example, you can see that oaks um, can support 456 different species of caterpillars. What you'll find is oaks will always come out on top. Oaks are the top producers of caterpillars. So if you could only add one plant, I would plant an oak. Now, of course, you're going to need enough space for an oak tree. Um, but again, that would be 
um, one action to make the biggest impact. Okay, you can see how the numbers um, are arranged. These are some of the top producers that I chose um, to show you. And we're going to go through and look at some of these um, plants individually. Okay, um, so if we look at um, oak trees, um, here are some examples of different species that you could choose and that you could add into your landscape. Um, I highly recommend if you have not read um, The Nature of Oaks by Doug Tallamy, it is a fantastic book um, to learn about the role of oak trees um, in our native plant food webs. So not just for caterpillars, but a whole host um, of wildlife. So again, that's The Nature of Oaks um, by Doug Tallamy. Um, and here are some examples of caterpillars um, and the moss that they will become that you can find supporting oak trees. Of course, I'm not gonna list 456 different caterpillars, um, but here are just a few examples. So in the top left corner, we have a giant leopard moth caterpillar, and that will become the beautiful black and white spotted uh, moth that you see below. In the top right picture, um, this is a painted lichen moth. So it's caterpillar um, will feed on oak trees. Um, in the middle picture, we have the pink striped oak worm moth, and in the bottom, the spiny oak slug moth caterpillar. Okay, notice how the last two um, had the word oak in their name. So sometimes we get clues of what plants these caterpillars um, use as host plants as their food source um, in their name. Okay, um, next up, if we look at birch trees, um, uh, in my area, that's going to be mainly the river birch. Um, they can support up to 274 different species of caterpillars, um, including the yellow bear, which is in the top left corner. Um, it looks like a yellow version of a woolly bear. Um, in the top right, we have the banded tussock moth caterpillar. Tussock moth caterpillars have those lashes um, near their head and near their bottom. Um, and then the caterpillar of the red spotted purple butterfly that you can see in the bottom picture. Okay, next up are maple trees. And while you might not want to necessarily add a maple tree to your yard, I know I'm constantly picking up tons and tons of sticks that seem to, to fall every single day from my maples. Uh, maybe this will convince you to, to not cut down a maple, but to leave it um, in your yard. Here are some different trees. Um, maple trees from black, red, silver, and sugar. And then the box elder is in the same genus as well. Again, not necessarily a tree you'd want to plant, um, but one that maybe you'd consider not removing. Um, and that's because they support 255 species of caterpillars, including the Eastern tiger swallowtail in the top right, um, which has that adorable eye spot and that yellow band on the back. We've got the blinded sphinx moth in the bottom right corner. And then on the left, the polyphemus moth. Okay, one of our silk moths. Okay, hickories are next and they support 231 species of caterpillars, again, in my area. Um, many different options um, from bitter nut to pecan um, to the shagbark hickory. And some of the um, caterpillars and moths that you can find, if you wanna support silk moth caterpillars, you should consider planting a hickory. Um, so the royal walnut moth, whose caterpillar is called the hickory horn devil, um, he's the second one from the right, um, will be found on hickories. You can also find the luna moth, which is the leftmost caterpillar, um, and the adult form is that beautiful green silk moth next to it. And then all the way to the right, we have the imperial moth, another silk moth. Um, but Hickories also support Io moths, Polyphemus moths, and Cecropia silk moths. So they really are um, great producers of those really stunning large silk moth species. Okay. Um, another one that they'll support is called the Habilis underwing moth. It doesn't really look like a remarkable moth just from the wing pattern, but when you see those underwings, it has that really striking red color underneath. Okay. If we look at a smaller tree, um, red bud um, is a great one that a lot of us include in our home landscapes. Um, it will support 22 species of caterpillars, so definitely nothing close to the oak, but still will hold its own. Um, it can support the spice bush swallowtail um, caterpillar, which is that orange one with the eye spots on the left, um, and the io moth, which is the picture in the center. Um, 
Just a note on caterpillars, if they have those spines or bristles on them, um, like that one in the picture, do not touch them because they can sting you and it is extremely painful. Um, and I am speaking from experience and no, it was not on purpose, it was an accident. All right, if we look at um, a shrub as well, buttonbush supports 24 species of caterpillars. It's a great shrub to plant if you have a lower spot in your garden that um, because it tolerates wet feet, but you also don't need an overly wet um, landscape to, to make it happy. Um, it will support caterpillars like the white marked tussock moth in the top right um, and the salt marsh moth caterpillar in the bottom right. Okay, um, so if we talk about planting our shrubs, planting our woody plants, um, I'm just going to show you an example of what um, I did at my home landscape. I actually planted these in the spring, but you could also do it um, in the fall right now. Um, so we decided to plant um, a native um, hedgerow shrub um, in our front yard. Um, so we bought a bunch of New Jersey teas. You can see my husband um, augured out some holes. We planted each of those individually. We did mulch a little bit around them just to help with moisture retention and to combat some of the weeds. And then we did cage them um, because New Jersey tea likes to be eaten by rabbits. Um, but you can see in the last two pictures, this is the growth that we achieved in one year. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, this fall, I did put in some beauty berries. Um, so again, great time um, to get those shrubs and get them in the ground. And then moving on from woody plants, I mentioned it's also a great time to plant bare root natives. Um, so if you haven't heard of bare roots before, um, it's a method of transplanting the plants during their dormancy, which often happens in either um, spring or fall is what are great times to plant them. And what you get, um, oftentimes you have to order these from an online nursery, and what you get is the root stock, okay, and the roots are going to look different. I like planting bare roots um, because they are a two to three year old plant typically. Um, and then you get to see what the root systems look like, um, which is pretty cool because we oftentimes don't get to see. Um, so here are just some examples um, of some different natives that I planted. Um, when you plant bare root, especially, it's very important that you label where you planted them um, because you won't have any above ground material um, for you to, to track where you planted them and remember where you put them in. So I like to just use some flagging and then um, in this case, I just used a zip tie and put it in the ground because I had a bunch of them sitting around. Um, but great time to plant um, bare root natives. But it's also not too late to plant plugs of native plants, okay? Um, and like I said before, planting in the fall can give them an easier transition time. Um, and this is something that I just did uh, about five days ago. Um, so it's not too late. So this is an example. I had this bare spot that looked horrible in my home garden. Um, moved aside the mulch. I got a bunch of different native um, perennials, um, including some native grasses, um, and then perennial plants that will bloom in spring, summer, and fall. Okay, got all of those put in, and I'm excited to see um, them flourish next year and grow. And then I don't have to worry about planting in the spring when it's a lot wetter um, than it is now. Okay, so if we talk about adding herbaceous plants, what should you add to your garden? Um, one thing that a lot of the times we don't think about is adding those plants that bloom in the fall. Um, so like I just said, I picked plants that bloom spring, summer, and fall. We don't want to forget the fall um, so that we always have something blooming and there's always that nectar source throughout the year. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is just go through a few groups of um, plants, native plants that you can consider adding um, that are fall bloomers. Um, they can be aggressive and spread. Um, and this is true of, of, of several of our native plants, um, but that's just kind of their natural growth form. Um, and if you're able to edge your garden and pay close attention to them, hopefully you'll be able to, to keep them in check. And if you plant several different aggressive species together, um, then they'll be working to outcompete one another and hopefully keep one another in check, okay? Um, so the first group we're going to look at are some sunflowers or native sunflowers in the helianthus genus. Um, these support 77 species of caterpillars. Okay, 
um, and also provide nectar for, as you can see, um, monarchs and other butterflies, long and short tongue bees, flies, and goldenrod soldier beetles. Okay, some of the caterpillars that they'll support, we can see um, the woolly bear, the beloved woolly bear on the bottom right. Um, and then um, up top, we have um, a rustic sphinx moth and its caterpillar will be found on um, sunflowers. Okay, so some examples um, include woodland sunflower. This one can get two to six feet tall and can be planted in full or partial sun. So even though it um, might seem like it likes the shade with that woodland in its mane, um, it really does well with more sun. And then it prefers moist to dry or kind of medium mesic soil. Okay, this plant's unique because it has really sandpapery leaves. So if you like adding plants with different textures, um, this is one to consider adding. Another sunflower that we have is Maximilian sunflower. This one does get quite a bit taller, um, so up to seven feet tall. And again, likes full to partial sun um, and medium, um, that's what music, we're gonna go with medium, um, to drier soil as well. Okay, next up are the goldenrods. Um, and don't shake your head at me, bear with me for a second. Um, goldenrods are really important. They support 112 species of caterpillars. That's a crazy number. That's almost as much as, and more than some of our woody species, right? Um, one caterpillar that you can find on goldenrod is the Baltimore or the black checker, which is this orange one in the top. Um, and of course, they're very important in providing nectar um, for all of those insects listed on the screen, okay? Um, also oftentimes see those goldenrod galls in that left picture on many of our goldenrods. So when it comes to goldenrod, there's a few species that you definitely want to avoid. So I, I do not want you to plant tall goldenrod or Canada goldenrod. Okay, they're very aggressive um, and they will spread um, everywhere. <laughs> so I'm sure most of us have seen a field full of goldenrod um, and oftentimes um, it's Canada or tall goldenrod that's filling those spaces, okay? Um, many of them, goldenrods, they're rhizomatous, so they're going to naturally spread. So you'll have to keep an eye on it and not be afraid to divide it and take some of it out of your landscape. But a few um, that are a little bit better behaved in your garden um, for you to consider are stiff goldenrod, okay? Can get two to five feet tall, likes full sun, um, and moist to slightly dry soil. This one has a more um, compact cluster of um, flowers um, and looks a little bit more tame than our, our Canada goldenrod. Um, showy goldenrod can get up to four feet tall, likes full or partial sun, slightly dry, slightly moist to dry soil. Okay, again, has more of that compacted um, head of flowers. And then my personal favorite is gray goldenrod, um, which tends to be shorter, although I did recently hear from someone that had it growing over four feet tall, um, but typically six to 30 inches tall. Um, it has a, an arching um, inflorescence, which that's the name for the collection of flowers, okay? And it likes drier, poor soil. So if you have some areas um, where you don't have the best quality soil, um, gray goldenrod is a good um, option for you. Okay, next up, I have to talk about sneezeweed. Um, sneezeweed has a very unfortunate name. It doesn't make you sneeze and it's not a weed. Um, it is a good native plant that can support eight species of caterpillars um, and then provide nectar for butterflies, skippers, bees, wasps, and flies, okay? Um, one species that we have is purple-headed sneezeweed. Um, grows up to three feet tall, full or partial sun, wet to moist soil. So if you have um, a rain garden or a lower spot in your yard, this would be a great option for you there. I think it's really striking with the purple um, head and then the ray, um, the yellow ray flowers, um, the petals below. Okay, we couldn't have a fall pollinator program without talking about the asters. Um, so asters can support 10 different species of caterpillars. Um, and they do wonders for our adult visiting pollinators, including many different types of bees um, and other types of bugs and even some of our birds, okay? So asters are like goldenrods um, in that they do like to spread. 
Um, but if you, you know, like I said, take those actions that we talked about earlier, um, you can keep them in check. So first up is smooth blue aster. It grows one and a half to three feet, like full or partial sun to mesic soil. It's a bit more delicate compared to some other asters and not as robust. And this one that will spread slowly, but tends not to be too aggressive. Um, so if you're looking for um, one that is gonna be a slow spreader, um, try smooth blue aster. Um, Heath aster grows up to two feet tall. It's quite a bit more robust, right? It's much more densely flowered um, than the last one. It likes full sun, average to dry soil. Um, next is New England aster, one of my personal favorites. Um, grows up to four feet tall, likes full or partial sun and moist to average soil. And then finally, um, silky aster. Um, this one is really unique. It's a shorter species, grows up to two feet tall. It has more of a black wiry stem and these very, very um, gray green silky leaves and then this beautiful purple flower. So it's a more delicate, um, a delicate aster to, to add a different element. Likes full sun, music to dry soil. Okay, a new one for me this year was blue sage. Um, blue sage can support nine species of caterpillars. Um, and this one I actually grew from seed um, and it grew and flowered in the first year and I had no problems with it. Um, so this one was very easy to grow. Um, it typically gets two to five feet tall and likes full sun and drier soil. And lastly, let's not forget our prairie grasses. Okay, so many of our grasses can be great fillers in our landscape beds and can be an underappreciated source of color and texture. And so depending on your landscape, there may be some options for you. Um, and you may even be lucky enough to find a tree frog hanging out on your grasses. Uh, if we talk about their role as host plants, native prairie grasses are host plants for skipper caterpillars. So if you want skipper butterflies, um, they mostly use grasses as their host plants, okay? Um, and then switchgrass also will host the larvae of, of some other insects that you can see listed on the screen as well. So let's look at a few examples of these grasses. Um, first is little blue, little blue stem. Um, grows between two and three feet tall and likes full sun, music to dry soil. Um, this one is absolutely stunning when it comes to fall colors. Um, right now it is turned that really bright, bright red. Um, botanists name red things blue, so like keep things confusing, keep you on your toes. Um, so little blue stem um, will have a red stem. Okay, if we want a larger um, bunch grass, and I will mention little blue stem is also a bunch grass, okay, so it grows in a nice clump. Um, switch grass is also a bunch grass, but it will get up to six feet tall, okay. Again, likes full sun, moist to music soil. Okay, prairie drop seed, another favorite, and I see it planted um, in landscaping beds all over the place now, um, has really thin um, leaves and forms that really dense clump, um, can get one to three feet tall, although those flowering stalks can be, you know, over four feet tall. The ones in my garden were over four feet tall this year. Likes full sun, music to dry soil. And then last I have side oats grandma. Okay, can get two feet tall. I've seen it get up to four feet tall if it's really happy. Um, full sun, dry soil is its preference. Um, and I added all of these into my home landscape. Those were the grasses that I chose um, to add in this year. Um, and they will keep that bunch format. Um, again, so it will look like a much more intentional grass planting um, rather than those, you know, um, lawn, <laughs> your lawn grasses that get in your garden beds that you're pulling out all the time. Okay, um, today's program was about fall, but some things to think about in winter. Um, if you don't have time this fall to work on building those bees for your Building those homes, excuse me, for your bees. That's a great winter project if you need to um, get out and work in your garage. Um, and if you do choose to plant native seeds, um, I've tried planting seeds for years and I have a low success rate. Um, so I prefer to get plugs, but seeds can be a much cheaper option. If you do wanna try planting native seeds, um, it's great to plant them outside. Um, after a snowfall or right before. If you're able to catch it right before a snowfall, then the snow will provide cover 
And as the snow melts, it will drag those seeds down into the ground. Um, but if you miss it before, you can also spread them out after snowfall. You may just lose some um, to the birds. Okay, one question I always get is where and when can I find these native plants? Okay, um, there are many local native plant nurseries throughout and outside of Illinois. Um, and there are often many farmers markets and plant sales, um, especially in the fall, there's often um, tree and shrub plant sales. Um, the Illinois Native Plant Society maintains a list of both native plant nurseries and plant sales on their website. So you can visit IllinoisPlants.org to look up um, and see what their current listings are. And then there are many online nurseries that you can explore as well. We're getting towards the end of this season. The timing of this webinar may have been just a week or two too late for you to get in those orders, but I encourage you to still look and see if you can get something um, sent to you for this fall, okay? Um, I will also mention um, for next year, if you miss fall planting, it's just too late, but you are interested in planting in the spring, um, if you do decide to order from an online nursery, plan to make your order in January or early February. Um, the plants will not ship to you until it's the right temperature for them to be planted in your area, okay? Um, but if you wait until April and May, oftentimes the plants that you're looking for are sold out. Um, so planning ahead and making that order in the winter time um, is, is a great um, consideration for you um, to think about. Okay, so to review for today, um, there are some small actions you can take to help pollinators this fall. Um, so think about leaving those stems of your perennial plants until springtime and then cutting them back, but only down to eight inches. Leave some leaves in your landscape. You can put them in your garden beds and leave some bare ground as well for ground nesting bees. Consider planting a native tree so it can support caterpillars as a food source. Um, and they don't have to be full grown trees before they're going to act as a host plant, okay? Even um, saplings one to two to three years old can start um, being a source of um, food for those caterpillars. And then consider planting fall blooming natives, um, whether bare roots or plugs this fall, or maybe try some seeds over the winter. Okay, let's talk resources. Um, I've mentioned that native plant finder Okay, um, again, that's the website where I was able to um, get that um, list of plants and the number of caterpillars they support by my zip code. So check that out. Um, if you're looking for a, um, a great source of information about pollinators, Heather Holm and all of her resources are fantastic. Um, I particularly like her book, Pollinators of Native Plants. I already mentioned Doug Tallamy, all of his books, again, fantastic resources. Um, and if you're looking about more specific information about identifying a certain plant or how to plant a native plant in your home garden, Illinois Wildflowers is my go-to resource. Okay, I also wanna mention these newer um, native plant garden guides that are being developed um, through a partnership between um, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and Illinois Extension. You can find them at the website listed on the screen, redoakraingarden.org resources. And they are putting together these wonderful guides to help you plant native plants in your home garden, okay? So like we've talked about today, how do I make a woodland garden um, in my home landscape? How do I make a pollinator garden in full sun? Um, so they're four page brochures. You can download them directly to your computer and print them out. Um, so I encourage you to check those resources out. Okay, as I wrap up today, I um, wanna make a plug for next month's Everyday Environment webinar, um, which is being given by Peggy. Um, today's moderator, and she's going to be talking about keeping feral swine out of Illinois. Um, so make sure that you um, check that out and sign up to hear um, Peggy's talk. I know I'm pretty excited to hear that one. Um, and as we end today, I do want to thank you all for being on.
Thank you for tuning in to CUI's TV. We hope you enjoyed the show. This video can be accessed anytime on youtube.com. In the YouTube search bar, type in UPTV6 and look for their microphone logo. We hope you will join us again next week for more local, engaging content designed specifically for Champaign County older adults. Take care and stay safe.